evening and welcome to Wednesdays with the Mayor here at the uh, Missoula Public Library. I'm Dennis Bragg, joined by Mayor Andrea Davis. We're here on kind of a stormy night. I uh, don't know when people are going to <laughs> It's raining pretty good. Somebody said, can you give us the weather forecast ahead of time? And I said, well, we need the moisture. Let's just stop and leave it at that. So we're going to talk a uh, real interesting and a, and a detailed discussion, but a follow-up to something we talked about with Mayor Hess last year. Uh, was the kickoff of this code reform process. And this is a pretty interesting topic and really affects the future. Uh, so let's get, let's dive into this. Give us a little background and uh, let's walk through a little bit about how we kind of got to this point and, and just from a top level view of what we're looking at here. All right, I, I'm, I'm pleased to do that and also say that I'm joined tonight by the community planning development and innovation staff that are working on this project. Um, which really are the real experts on this. And so um, we'll have an opportunity to um, invite folks up and introduce who those who those staff members are. But the overview of this project is it's called Our Missoula. And um, something we often do is make sure we plug many times where the public can find information. The city has an Engage page. So it literally is called Engage Missoula. You could look up Our Missoula and you would get to a whole host of information about this um, review of our development codes and an update to our growth policy. The city's growth policy was last um, written um, and adopted in 2015. And our development codes, for the most part, are pre-2015. So we have a whole batch of different development codes and other policies that we have adopted as a municipal body. Um, plans that um, may not necessarily fit together. And as, uh, of course, many people know in this room and those watching, we have had a number of uh, development pressures over the years, and there is a real need and opportunity to take a look at uh, the entire package of not only how development codes work together to better streamline those, not only for folks that are building in the community, so developers, builders, but also, you know, you want to put a deck on your on your house or build a garage, it affects everybody. Um, and, um, and in addition, really taking a look at our growth policy, making sure that the values that the community um, assi assign the community, really what we identified as our values, really still hold true as we move through this. So it's a relatively lengthy process. Um, when we engaged with the consultant, Missoula is an engaged community. And um, what would normally be a two-year process, we really gave it some additional time, mostly because on these land use development or land use planning decisions, oftentimes, historically, you would have kind of the typical stakeholders and players that would be at the table. You know, folks that um, often are engaged with larger planning processes, but many people that are affected by these policies are often not at the table for one reason or the other. They either don't know how to engage, they either feel intimidated by the process, um, perhaps they work during the times that maybe a municipality yeah, a, holds that's these. definitely an issue there. Yeah, mm -hmm. so we took time, we actually added a full year to the process in order to make sure we did a lot of education and outreach to different parts of the community to make sure folks were engaged in this. So we are about halfway through this process and a lot of that early work was engagement, education, outreach, and evaluation. And tonight, we're talking about the code diagnostic, which is a pretty significant milestone when it comes to this process because it is more or less casting light on our current development codes and putting light on how they do not meet our other policies that we have adopted since the time we passed our growth, our growth policy in 2015. I think it's interesting because when you look at the the overall effort of planning, it's obviously to you know make healthy communities, to accommodate things like housing pressures, to have responsible development, whether it's environmental or you know neighborhood goals, um, and you want to have that economic vitality. But like you say, a lot of times those policies and, and procedures and regulations are over here, and planning policies over here, and maybe you know something else is over here. So if you're an, especially an average person, you. I think your example of the garage or the deck is a perfect example, yeah. right? You go, well, how come I can't build a garage? My neighbor built a garage 10 years ago, mm -hmm. you know? So there's a lot of questions that can come up as you go along. And I think also speak for a minute too about how gathering all this at this time is, is super critical because you think of how the city ch has changed, not only since that 2015 policy, 
but even with those older developments, some of those regulations, right? So it's nice to yeah. pull all that together at this point and look forward. Yeah, it is. Um, as 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 my predecessor said, um, Mayor Hess, it's like a junk. You know, our current development code is like codes, multiple codes, or like your you know junk drawer in your kitchen. You know, you open it up and you're like, well, it's, what I need in here is somewhere, <laughs> and and that not only impacts people that are moving through the process, it impacts our staff. I mean, you know, people that our hired professionals working for the city uh, need to be able to have a predictable set of policies and plans that they can then be predictable to the public. And so not having inconsistencies amongst our policies um, make it challenging. I mean, I'll, I'll explain another example that I think is something that is a um, uh, illustrates a value that we have as a community and it does sometimes conflict with uh, some other values and needs we have. So we have a we have a policy to um, adopt. We've adopted the complete streets um, uh, model, and a complete street is what it sounds like. You know, it's both driving lanes, bicycle lanes, curb, gutter, sidewalk. When you can, median sidewalk. So you have shade trees. That's the ideal situation. And there are times where requiring that kind of complete street code does impact a particular development in a way that might really tip it over the edge in terms of affordability. Or, you know, we don't live in a, in a perfectly flat space everywhere. We have a lot of t topography and older parts of our community that are being redeveloped to consider. And so we need to be fair in how we apply these policies. And so the way that our current policies are written make it challenging sometimes for staff to be able to make those decisions. And we're also working on clarifying what is administrative and making sure that we can have make sense decisions at the administrative level and then what really needs to get to city council um, for the elected body to then make decisions. Um, and so, you know, some of the other policies that we've adopted since the time our growth policy has been a place to call home in 2019, which was, is our, um, our housing policy. policy. Um, and a, a whole host of other, uh, you know, I have a great diagram in here I can pull out later that shows all of these different policies and plans that we've adopted since basically our growth policy. The other things that affected our long-range transportation plan, Mountain Line, which is a separate jurisdiction from the city, but still, they're our bus system, and their strategic plan are things that we need to be considering when we're talking about how our development codes and land use policies impact the ability for transit to basically be maximized for the benefit and for and our that's residents. that's a classic example, because I know you had experience with Mountain Line, and you look at this, and, and you think about how that's changed even since 2015, all of a sudden now, electric buses, now we've got seven-day service. Uh, now we've had Russell Street redeveloped, so it's really time to go back and, and uh, assess all of that, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Uh, one other question, uh, too, from a background standpoint, when we talk about um, trying to pull all this together, and this is maybe, a, we'll get back to this, uh, but the Montana legislature also has been, you know, kind of coming in from a topper, uh, you know, higher level, saying, well, communities should do this, should do that. It's a whole different political animal, but does that also perhaps put some urgency in trying to make sure that our policies obviously meet state level changes, but, but are something we can use, tools we can use here. Absolutely. Uh, so this, the, the 2023 legislature did pass several land use bills that um, fortunately we were already on the path to updating our growth policy and our development codes. However, um, we did need to somewhat step off the, the, the track that we were on to make sure that the mandated legislation could be uh, um, basically put into code by the required time frame. So in October of 2023 was the first tranche of legislative updates. And an example would be that we uh, updated the way in which we process minor subdivisions. And that allows that minor subdivision uh, to um, be handled in a more streamlined fashion. A minor subdivision is when you have Five? Three, three? Five. Yeah, five lots or less. Um, and then in just here in March, April, we adopted the second tranche of updates, some of which were directly mandated from legislation, and then some of them were pieces that we were already working on. You might know that while the state passed certain pieces of legislation, there are some that are actually uh, enjoined. They're currently um, under a court case right now. 
we already were making progress along those lines and it made sense for us to continue on with that work. We would have done that as a whole package as part of this development code update. However, we had already started making so much progress because of the state mandate on the timeline that we carried forward with those things. So that might look like um, what's considered um, accessory dwelling units or you know, granny cottages, alley houses. We uh, continue to move forward with what is in the legislation except it's enjoined right now in court. And it was basically increasing the size of the ADU. So we had a fairly complicated way in which we calculated the maximum size a person could build an accessory dwelling unit. It had to do with the size of the home. That was the, the main home. And, and, and so the state legislation was recommending 1,000 square feet. And we just moved forward with that. And in fact, our city council actually approved 1,200 square feet. Um, so there's uh, some interesting opportunities like that to make it easier to build some you know, in this case, gentle density, ways that we can utilize our existing infrastructure, that our staff were in a good place to get those things done. Um, they did have to pull out elements of what they were working on in order to accomplish that while still doing this work. We're still on track for getting the overall unified development code complete uh, in, and implementable um, by spring of 2025. But we're in a lot better position because of all the work that's been going on. Uh, you already have the books open. You're already l under the hood. So being able to make an adjustment, whether it's a state level adjustment or now something that's economically driven or whatever it is here at home, you're already in there. You already got your hands dirty, right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, exactly. I mean, and this is one of the conversations that's happening all over the country and how we have talked up uh, how communities have uh, basically uh, legislated land use. Um, is a topic that has gotten more attention than it ever has. And it is an, a very interesting conversation around the country and around the world, I would say, but in particular in the United States around equity. And um, what we know in some of the work that we've done to date, you know, a lot of the background work we di have done has really given us more of like a scientific approach and assessment. So the decisions we make are based in facts, um, not just assumptions. And one of those is an equity and land use report. And that equity and land use report does does tell us what we think it would, which is that there are a few neighborhoods in our community that basically take on most of the density. Um, those neighborhoods also don't have adequate infrastructure. We have over 60, 65% of our uh, zoned land in the city of Missoula that is zoned single family. And so there are, when, when you take a look at where people are um, also being dislocated because of redevelopment opportunities, there are, are concentrated neighborhoods where that is happening. And that's really an equity issue. Um, and so that will help inform the decisions that we make. The big, the, the, you know, stepping back in terms of these milestones, you know, we have this assessment, we've done this research, we've had these listening sessions, we've heard from the public, um, we've done a lot of our own research. And then this code diagnostic really does help, like I said, illuminate uh, the challenges and the conflicts that we have with existing policies. Um, the idea behind this is that this will then inform larger visionary statements, guiding principles, and those guiding principles will be brought forward by the staff to, and the administration, to city council. And city council will adopt that as basically a policy statement for the staff to then go and build that unified development code around. I think also it's interesting, one final thing on that, that you know we do have challenges here. I mean, I, I'm always fascinated. I, I spent so many years working in the Puget Sound region and part of the problem always was there's always a, a river or a bay or something like that. And we don't have bays, but we have a lot of rivers. We have a lot of bridges to, to worry about and how that affects traffic. And, you know, what's our water system like? And, oh, gosh, it's a mountain. We can't go up the side of that. Yep. I mean, ge geographically, we have a very interesting opportunity here, don't we, really? Well, we do. And actually, Missoula geographically is constrained pretty substantially when you compare us to some of the other larger communities in Montana. I mean, if Billings, if you've been to Billings, you can see, I mean, there's quite an expanse that you can really develop in more of a grid system or in some ways um, there is more private land that is in developable reach. In the Missoula Valley, you mentioned, of course, we have the Clark Fork River. Um, not only that, I mean, we've got multiple streams. We've got the Rattlesnake watershed coming through. We've got the Bitterroot flowing in, and we've got, of course, all of that merging um, within basically close to city limits. 
then um, we, topography wise, I mean, we really are surrounded by a lot of publicly owned land. So that includes, you know, National Forest Service or BLM. We may have some lands in conservation. Most of the lands we have in conservation are not developable lands anyway. I mean, you know, we aren't going to, you know, Go place hills on Mount yeah. Deanstone. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, but we are in places where, yeah, we do live in a topography constrained valley. And, um, and not only do we have a, a river, we've got a railroad, and then we've got a, a, the interstate that flows through. So yeah, those are all big considerations, and that's largely what influenced, I mean, a lot of the focus inward approach that our 2015 growth policy has spoken to. And that's been like the main mandate that we have moved forward with as a city is focus inward, focus inward, both recognizing that it is the most economic use of infrastructure dollars, um, but it also does bring, uh, you know, uh, people closer to services, jobs, and the heart of the community. So that's been the overall mandate um, over time, which has definitely directed uh, our decision-making up into this point. I, and I, I think that's interesting. And one other final question, too, and then we'll bring staff up. Uh, we also really are not looking at a situation where we're throwing the baby out with the bathwater, though. I'm sure as they go through, there's probably things they find, whether it's in the growth policy from 2015 or maybe even some older regulations where it's like, that's a pretty good idea. Yep. That's still working, or it matches what we're finding in this assessment, right? I mean, this is this is a, a, a from ground zero, but there's some good. We've done some good work in the past too, right? Most definitely. I mean, the complete streets is a good example of something where, like, that is a a, a trend we want to continue with. We want to make sure that when we are building out uh, new development or when we are redeveloping major redevelopment in our community, that we are considering multi mode modal transportation. Um, that is, uh, through the Unified Development Code, we can start to shape that decision making in a lot of ways. In some ways, it's sort of like a paradigm shift. Um, a lot of things have been relatively siloed, and this isn't just Missoula. I think this is Oh, it's pretty probably much universal. pretty universal how we've been thinking about planning over the years. You know, it's like, well, you, th you think about roads, and then, you know, you think about, you know, bicycle, pedestrian, and you think about transit, but all those things impact each other. And so the way that we can approach our, our planning and our codes to bring these um, pieces together that helps us um, do a better job of the considerations, not only for the built environment today, but we always have to be considering about what's going to Missoula going to look like in a decade, two decades, and five decades from now. I, l I like where you use that phrase paradigm shift, because that really, you know, someone who's followed planning for a long time, you know, the approach we took 30 or 40 years ago uh, got us to a certain point. But, you know, the idea of, well, let's just block out this and that's a, a certain kind of zone or this is a certain kind of zone or something like that didn't take into consideration, well, where does that go with a, a thing like multimodal transportation or energy use? or water in the West, especially. So yeah, paradigm shift is a good way to put it. I like that. Uh, if, you're if you're watching this live and you have a question, you want to call us, 406-546-7692, uh, 406-546-7692. Uh, we can take those calls if you're watching live. And uh, let's go ahead and invite our staff. Let's get Emily and Ben up here. That would be great. Yeah. All and right. While they're coming up, if you want to read off their official title. Absolutely. So, that right. so we've got Ben Brewer here this evening, and he is our planning supervisor. And then we have Emily Glucken, and she's our senior planner. Great. Good. Yeah. Well, yeah. welcome to both of you. We want to get into some of the details a little bit. And Emily, I think I'll start with you. Let's talk about the process a little bit, just to give us a snapshot of, of where, we've, you know, where we've come from, starting in 2022, and kind of where we're at phase-wise and, you know, it seems like we're at a real interesting median point right now with this. Yeah, we are pretty much smack in the middle of this project. We're in phase three out of six, so halfway there. Um, phase three has been dubbed scenarios for the future, and we're um, we're right in the middle of that right now. And um, that is where we will really kind of take everything we've learned so far and start to visualize what that means and um, what the options are for where we could go from here. Um, prior to this in phase two, and the code diagnostic is really kind of symbolizing the, the close out of that, um, that was our existing conditions phase. Um, we called it defining the problem. So spending a lot of time understanding um, where we are today. Um, that's where um, Mayor Davis mentioned the equity and land use report. We did a deep dive into equity um, and did pretty broad community engagement, just understanding like where are we at today as a community in terms of values and needs and what needs are not being met and, and all of that. And um, that's all being calibrated 
into this next phase. Um, coming up after we bring a menu of scenarios forward will be when we um, really get into the, the meat and potatoes of it and um, start to bring out drafts um, publicly of an updated growth policy and updated UDC. So it that'll seems, be later this year. See, and, and I'm terrible for bad metaphors, but it seems to me like, you know, you've got the car, it's making a noise, right? You don't know what it is, so you take it in. They plug in the OBD, but they say, well, we got to figure this out. Let's take it on the road. It seems like we've gone through that. Now we're back in the shop. Is that kind of a fair way to sort of look at it in a, in a folksy sort of way? I think so. Also, we love metaphors, so okay. all <laughs> about them. Um, yeah, we. I mean, we, we've kind of gone through and done, done the diagnostic on what's going on with the car and now um, starting to put together some options for how can we repair it and kind of how can we get back on the road. Ben, I'm going to ask you a little bit about this. Let's talk about one thing in particular, because we've heard so much about the housing issue over that, especially since the pandemic. But this last three, four years, it's all about affordable housing. It's about housing equity, as Mayor Davis said. Talk a little bit about how this process of the, uh, you know, expanding housing options, just to take that as one example of how this has been folded into this process. Um, yeah, that's a great question. And um, that's, a, that's one of our... Um, uh, you know, a key focus of this this project, and um, one of the um, most challenging issues that we're um, seeing and, and facing as a as a community, and, and that we're looking to um, find ways to, to to address through the through the project. Um, we were talking about the the growth policy earlier, and the the focus inward um, idea that's in that, and and you know, I just wanted to maybe I'll we'll start there that you know. Like you, you were saying earlier, this this is not kind of a tearing it all down to build it up again. You know, we, we think we have a good idea here and, and a good direction with the focus inward um, concept where that, you know, we, we live in a constrained um, <clears throat> place topographically. Um, it's it's more efficient um, for us to, to grow inward where we have infrastructure already and to, and to um, build on that rather than to continue kind of sprawling out in a way that kind of costs more to the city and, and for the and the residents uh, living there um, and uh, and so you know that's that's the key concept that we want to um, reconfirm through this process but also you know what, what it hasn't included in the past and that we want to bring into it through this project is this consideration of equity that we were talking about earlier and um, and that's really where we get into um, you know within that um, that plan or that strategy that growth strategy um, where can you, where, where do we allow housing currently or, and where, where could we um, allow more of it? And something that we are looking at through this project is um, uh, how that um, uh, allow, allowance or capacity for housing is distributed um, throughout the community and amongst different um, neighborhoods. And, and, you know, we find, um, including in the equity analysis that uh, we did for the project previously, that, um, you know, there, there are parts of the community that are bearing uh, more of a brunt of growth and that are taking on more um, more growth and more housing than than others and that's something that we're looking at through this and I, um, and I think it, it just one example I mean you think about interesting in 2015 is sort of a remark go out to the North Reserve area and just look at what's happened there in the last 10 years even with the multifamily and those kind of things I mean it's really clustered in one thing is that kind of what we're talking about I mean just as one example of a particular area just really having a particular kind of housing. <clears throat> yeah, that's an interesting example. Um, th that's an area that, that is, it's uh, one of our few remaining areas in town that we are able to actually expand yeah. outward into. Um, and so when we, we think of that area, I mean, it is, it is certainly growing and it's growing rapidly, but it's also um, growing in a place that didn't previously have mm -hmm. um, d um, as much established development. Um, and I think um, the, the flip side of that is how, how and where can we um, look for opportunities to, for, for growth in places that are already, already built, built and, and developed and established. Um, and that gets back to the infrastructure point that we've been talking about, too, because if you're able to, uh, you know, essentially disperse a lot of that, then you don't have one potential, like, like North Reserve is, where everybody, you know, 50-some thousand cars a day are trying to use one street, right? Mm -hmm. And so in the long run, I imagine from a planning standpoint, that's a, that's a desirable uh, aspiration, isn't it? <clears throat> yeah, I think, you know, the um, on the on the policy side of things, there's kind of, you know, there's, there's four or five main 
uh, issues and challenges and, and goals that, that we're really um, aiming to, to work through here, and, and equity is certainly one of them, but you know, also our ha uh, housing and has housing capacity, um, but um, mobility and mobility options and um, our, our um, goals for um, addressing climate change and, and um, providing resilience you know, within the city to climate change. So um, they're all connected, you know, and that's something that we're looking at. Um, and, and we've identified ways that that is the case um, you know, previously through other planning efforts um, and that's something that the diagnostic really, um, it, you know, is one of the things that the diagnostic calls out is that we, we, we've established goals for this, and, um, but there are ways that our uh, development rules either um, make it complicated to do what we say we want to do or, or they even don't allow it in, in some cases. So. I, I'm going to go back to my mechanic <laughs> metaphor. So if I've got the car in the shop, and Emily, you're my mechanic, and I say, what's the, what's the damage? You know, what's the, what do we look at? What, if you could give a grade for what the diagnostic is telling us. Uh, you know, I know that's probably hard to do, but, but how, are we, how have we done, and how much do we have to fix here, generally? I mean, that's a big question, but uh, do your best. <laughs> Grade-wise, maybe like C plus? I don't know. I'm just C plus, like that. B minus, something like that. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> and I imagine that varies according to different categories. Obviously, yeah. Right? Yeah. And so um, I can talk through some of the findings yeah, and, and yeah, do. what we found under the hood. Yeah. And I'm going to use my cheat sheet if that's okay. But um, the the code diagnostic boiled down to four key findings. Um, the first being, as we've already mentioned a little bit, that um, our codes present barriers to housing equity, supply, and affordability. Um, this drew a lot from our equity analysis that we did. And then we also took a deeper dive and did some kind of prototype testing into specific codes like parking requirements, landscaping requirements, um, setbacks, uh, things like that, and how those add add cost and just add or limit the amount of space that you can dedicate to a dwelling unit versus needing to provide those on site. And, and I want to pause there because sure. just as a just as an average Joe, parking in particular. You know, I think about how parking codes of 20, even 20 years ago were like, okay, everybody owns a car. Maybe they have two. You're trying to build multifamily. You've got to have this. You've got to have off-street parking. You can't do that. That, in particular, is a thing that's, that's really changing and is changing going forward, too, right? Yes. Um, it's, it's definitely um, something that's shifting, not just in Missoula, but the idea of parking requirements in general, I'd say, all across the country. It's, it's really a shifting ideology and um, how we can get people around in a not car dependent way is um, definitely yeah. something that we're considering. Proceed. I just, I just yeah. wanted to sort that out because it, that was an example of yeah. something that was out of date. I would say that's a that's yeah. a bit of a paradigm shift too. Ahead, from where we're at. Okay. Um, the second finding is that codes present barriers to compatible infill development and limit diversity. Um, one example is, well, just a general example, we have a lot of older neighborhoods in Missoula that um, have houses that are like built up close to the street or maybe smaller and closer together. Maybe there's triplexes in there. Um, but in the zones that they are today, that wouldn't be allowed. Like if someone were to remove those historic buildings and try and build according to the code, we wouldn't be able to build that same pattern of development. So we have a bit of a misalignment there. Um, and then as Ben was mentioning earlier, um, just generally we our codes limit just the types of buildings that you can make in our different neighborhoods across the city and the types of housing that we can provide. Um, so we're really limited to just kind of a number of um, housing options like single family homes is the vast majority of what we see or multi-dwelling buildings in our higher density neighborhoods. Um, so something the code diagnostic looked at was that area in between of what we call missing middle housing, which is that range of housing that falls on that spectrum in the middle there. And that's a change in uh, planning philosophy, mm -hmm. right? Because it was always, the last few years, 30, 40 years, it was always like, okay, all the single family goes here, multifamily goes here. Yep. Now we're finding from an infrastructure standpoint, but also from what people can afford and want to live, they, they like mixed use. So, so that's an update, right? In terms of how, how do we approach that, that change? Yeah, and I think this is really um, reflective of the one of the main findings of the equity and land use report, which is that um, almost half of our city is single single dwelling zoning. Um, I think two thirds of it is just up to a duplex would be allowed, but only 
about a third of Missoulians can afford that housing type. Um, so that middle, those housing types in the middle kind of add that um, access to housing that people otherwise couldn't afford. And I want to stress something here that, that we, I don't want to gloss over, uh, but one thing that really struck out to me as I was reading where we're at, this is, this is a case we're still talking about the overarching picture. We're not down to saying, here's, oh, now we're going to, this is the new rule, you're going to have multifamily next door or, you know, right? I mean, that, that's to come. This, we're still at that top, that upper level right now in terms of assessment, right? Yes, exactly. So this um, code diagnostic especially was looking at our existing codes that we have um, and um, where we're at today. And then um, to come, we will be publishing a code reform approach, and that's what, where we can get a little deeper into, um, you know, we know what this, we've learned what the problems are, we've defined the problem, what are some um, paths forward to addressing them? Yeah, It'll give like us Mayor a roadmap said, for doing that's that. where the council will be involved. We'll talk a little mm -hmm. bit more about future public involvement, but that's a big part of that, right? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Good point. Anything else that I'm missing here? Here we go. Now. This yeah. is a huge topic. Yeah. Yeah. We, there, this document is, I think, 120 pages, so there's a lot in it, and um, trying to distill it down is <laughs> tough. But I'll just um, kind of give you the two the two other highlights. But um, so. This report found that our codes, for the most part, do not support our mobility and climate policies. We talked a little bit about that, but we have um, our complete streets policies. We have climate goals for, um, you know, reducing our, 20, our 2030 plan, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, just um, kind of reducing the impact of climate change, things like that. And um, as Ben mentioned before, this this really found that uh, there is misalignment between what our codes actually allow or actively prevent and what we want to achieve as a city. Um, and then our final uh, finding is that the codes are difficult to navigate for all users and um, this impacts, you know, the rate at which things can get permitted, how complicated or expensive or um, confusing for all parties involved. Um, we have a lot of codes and we have them in a lot of different places. Um, really like that junk drawer idea you can go around and know what to look for. So um, that's uh, that's really a, an issue for usability and just predictability and um, being able to predict what our outcomes will be as a city. And a question for Ben, how does that affect that, you know, the long-term mechanics when you guys are trying to plan or somebody's at the counter asking questions when somebody comes in, wants information, uh, how, how does that level of organization improve the efficiency of, of what you guys are asked to do nowadays? Yeah, I mean, th this goes back to the junk drawer metaphor, I think, that uh, Mayor Davis um, brought up earlier. And, and you know, that, that's a pretty apt um, uh, metaphor that, that we've used for this project where um, it's hard to find the tool you're looking for or even know what tool um, you're supposed to use it's for your, the there, project right? that you have, right? <laughs> um, and uh, so that's, you know... The, We've talked about kind of shifts in planning and and, and uh, um, best practices and and whatnot, and um, you know unifying uh, development codes so that they're all in one place, so that they use the same definitions, processes, um, and uh, you know are, uh, relate to to one another and are are maintained together, updated together, um, operated, um, uh, you know, all from one source um, is kind of the. <clears throat> a, a trend that we're seeing and that we that we um, have identified and, and think is is what Missoula you know is right for Missoula and and, and will, uh, would be helpful. Um, so that that's uh, part of that part of what we're going for. Just to give us kind of a sort of a thumbnail uh, snapshot of things, uh, what are some of the ideas you've heard? And again, emphasizing that we're not to the point of putting things in code yet. Uh, but what are some of the more intriguing things with these four things that you talked about that if that maybe have crossed uh, Your radar uh, Ben and then we'll ask Emily as well uh, What are some of the more innovative suggestions or things that caught you by? Yeah, um, uh, well for one thing, you know, we'll, we'll point Folks that are um, looking at the diagnostic or interested in following up on it, that there there are, you know, a, a lists of considerations for the code reform uh, effort that are um, associated with these kind of main findings that, that Emily's been reading for, and and those really are, are some of the more actionable 
considerations or insights um, that the, the report is um, uh, pointing out and, and identifying. Um, and so, you know, the, this is primarily focused on uh, identifying what's what's broken, what we want to fix, what, what are the barriers to development that um, we are experiencing and find, you know, in our codes and, and processes now. Um, but, you know, there there are, I, um, I think, uh, uh, insights in here that, that point us towards where how we might want to um, um, deal with them or, or act to, to correct those. Um, yeah, Emily, what about uh, that? Has there been some things that have sort of been intriguing to you as we've gone through this uh, first half of the process here? Yeah, I think <clears throat> most of the innovative ideas that I've heard, um, especially just being out doing public engagement, um, it's been really fun to see or hear what um, what's on people's minds and um, just some creative ideas or solutions or, or problems. Um, it's hard to pick just a few, but um, it, it's just generally surprising to hear like what people really value. One thing that stood out to me for a while since we did a workshop about um, what people value most in their neighborhoods, there were a lot of people that responded that irrigation ditches, like they love them. Um, oh. And we would have never thought about that. Yeah. Um, the but sound now, of running water, probably. Yeah, it's like yeah. Um, considered kind of like a natural amenity, and you can have a nice yeah, bridge over features. it. Um, so, I mean, conversations like that have just kind of gotten logged away. Like, oh, yeah, like um, I think it speaks to the importance of noticing the really unique characteristics in each neighborhood and, and highlighting them and... Um, it might not be things that we're actively thinking about in our planner brains, so um, those are well, but that really fun to, to hear. The diversity of Missoula, too, doesn't it? Really, I mean, that's the thing. You may, you know, if you're not living in the Rattlesnake or if you're not out in Miller Creek, there's going to be things that, yeah, you drive through and you, you don't know. But if you're there 24/7, you you come up with ideas. Yeah. Ben, um, thanks. Yeah, I just want uh, you know to add to that um, too, as far as what we're what we're hearing and and what. Um, you know, in some ways it's surprising is, you know, we, we hosted uh, a, a series of um, workshops um, in February, March, February, um, that were, you know, really focused on on housing options uh, and housing diversity in our in our residential areas in town. And, you know, going back to, to questions about um, uh, housing and, um, you know, we, we talked with people and, and uh, facilitated a kind of a, an exercise to um, set up conversations around, you know, what, what are you comfortable with um, when you think of your neighborhood changing and, and what, what kind of um, added capacity or added building types or housing types of housing in your neighborhood uh, would you want to see or be comfortable with? And, you know, we, we were... Um, uh, you know, we heard a lot of support in the in in, in those conversations for you know considering um, uh, neighborhoods that include not just um, a home or not just a home and an ADU, but you know potentially um, a, a additional building types and housing types that could allow for for more housing in in more types of places. Um, so you know that is something that it's a bit of a surprise, and it's something that we want to keep talking about and hearing about and hearing that um, uh, we're where you know we want to want to go and with this project in Missoula, so. I'm fascinated by this because it it you know people don't realize how much demographics and culture affect planning, mm -hmm. and and so I think of particular the neighborhood shopping kind of experience. You know, if you think about oh, it used to be everybody goes to the mall all the way through the 80s and 90s and and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And I remember even talking with Peter Lambros a few years ago, and we were talking about how they were trying to reconfigure even the mall. But he said to me at that point, and this has been 10 years ago, he said, things are changing. People don't aren't that worried about car ownership. They're, they want to have things close. And so I think of like up at the top of uh, Christian Drive and, and Miller Creek, where that, that little place was put in there uh, that has, you know, offers various, you know, retail and food and those kinds of things. That's an example of demographics, right? And so that's, I would imagine that's the value of trying to come back with this diagnostic tool and base it on people uh, as much as planning, right? Yeah. Yes, Mayor Davis. I, I just want to illustrate, what I think, what, what is also being said and things that I've heard maybe not necessarily from, I mean, from the, the outreach um, workshops, but also just, you know, from day-to-day -day engagement with citizens 
is um, if we think about some of the neighborhoods that often are, we we think of fondly, right? So like um, the hip strip, that neighborhood, the residential area that interfaces with that neighborhood is one that people think of and comment on fondly. They, it's, you know, there's, there's uh, not only retail, commercial, business, um, uh, professional office, um, but it's it's walkable. People can drive to it. People can ride their bikes. They can take the bus. They can walk. There are options for people, but it is accessible. And so as we think about how we develop our land use plan and then the development codes that surround that, how are we able to basically create more nodes in our community that brings that kind of neighborhood amenity to more neighborhoods? We've had a few places in town that... Um, you know, we can think about the Rattlesnake Gardens or what is now the, the patio in the Rattlesnake and um, or um, the um, Flor the Florabella, which is which was um, Cafe Dolce. Thank you. <laughs> oh yeah, thank you. And, you know, the neighbors at first were very concerned with both of those developments because there's always the concern of the unknown. There's the concern of traffic. There's the con concern of what might this, you know, uh, um, restaurant or activity bring to our neighborhood. And in reality, we hear far more support for those kinds of things because now those neighbors recognize that they have that amenity within striking distance of where they live that they don't have to necessarily get in their car and drive across town for that benefit and more and more people are asking for that i live in the franklin to fort neighborhood when i first moved in to that neighborhood there was the 12th street market it was it was more or less a small little um back of a house that was a small market and i could get toilet paper on a sunday morning without having to get in my car because it was within a couple of blocks. There is not really anything within uh, close proximity, although the good food store is about nine blocks away, so not terrible, but those kinds of small coffee shops or things that allow people to connect. From a philosophical perspective, there are things I think we're hearing from the public that really ring true across a lot of social science studies in so many ways. We call these places third third spaces, third places. We're sitting in a third place right now. You know, our first place is our home. Our second place is often where we work, but it's still private. And then this is a third place. These are public areas that we gather and we exchange ideas, we build relationships, we form community. And that, you talked about demographics and trends. And over the last several decades, we've trended away from these third spaces. Our our development patterns and zoning have actually enforced that. Yeah. Even the way we have, you know, I mean, you think about the ability to pull into your uh, driveway, into your parking garage, into your um, garage, and walk into your home from inside the garage. Do you talk to your neighbor on your way in? You, you don't. It impacts your behavior, yeah. right? See, but there was this little thing called a pandemic, and I think that changed. What's that? Well, it changed, well, if you recall. Uh, it changed a lot of the mindset, though, because I think people now, you know, after those two years of relative isolation, yeah. now the third place concept in neighborhood really starts to, to come back. In I place. think you're right, Dennis. Yeah. Now, but we're not talking about getting rid of choice. And, and I, I bring this back to the ADU debate of about 10 years ago, where you had some folks that wanted that. A university district was like a war zone over this. Because part of the people were like, no, you can't absolutely never put those. Others were like, no, we, we live close to UM and we'd like to be able to offer that. Um, so we're not getting rid of choice. In fact, if anything, we're, we're getting back to that ground level to let neighbors and, and, and these smaller neighborhoods sort of drive what, what is that nature like, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think like Emily said earlier, I think what's ironic about some of what our current land use and zoning codes um, portray is that we have some parts of town you think about like fourth you know again like you know where you've got townhomes you've got maybe a row some row houses that share walls mm -hmm. um there's some of what are almost our most iconic beautiful neighborhoods they're they're still uh, approachable from a human scale we couldn't rebuild that in some of these neighborhoods because they have been zoned since then as single family and um, it's, it's an irony because I, I think those examples help illustrate w what we're talking about and 
when we get public feedback, that's a lot of what we're hearing. We also know that um, we are at a time when development costs are at an, at an all-time high, and that's relative to the cost of land. It's it's relative to the cost of development, which is why we're doing this work because we recognize that the regulatory environment has an impact on the cost of development. Um, it's 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 relative to the market, what people are willing to pay, um, and then energy use and consumption. And we have you know residents and citizens and 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 the community is is more aware than ever around um, you know the 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 cheapest energy is the energy you don't use and not only are we have the opportunity to save money in our pocket but we're also reducing impact on the environment and it is a community goal for us to do that it's a community driven goal when we have the opportunity to create some spaces like like even my home was built in 1935 it is a three story house and it is 1700 square feet wow. so as an example right yeah most homes today that are built that are three stories that are, you know, technically they're not bedroom, you know, because I don't have egress in the, in the basement, but um, let's just say a three bedroom, two bath house is well over 2,200 square feet. Yeah. And that costs money. It costs money. And at this point, people are realizing like, maybe I don't need that much space. Maybe I could actually have space built differently and people would have more options and opportunity. But that also speaks to that diversity of neighborhoods. So if I'm coming in or, you know, and I talk to the realtors all the time about this because this has become a problem where you have people that, you know, my age, for example, kids have moved out. I, I should downsize. Right. There's no options. Right. Or say I want to be in an older classic neighborhood where there are single family homes. No, I'd love to be in a neighborhood uh, like the other side of Ogren Park where there's a lot of facilities close. Having diversity, I think, is also one of those real aspirations here, though, right? It, it is. I mean, that is a really good example of uh, a situation we call folks that are overhoused. And so that means that, you know, a lot of people feel like they don't want to move from the home that they have had in ownership for decades because there's really no options. There's no good options for people to move into. Um, and this hopefully would free up our existing housing stock for people that then may be able to, families that might be able to move into a larger home. It All these things are connected. And this is connected to how Missoula County Public Schools evaluates its census. You know, where are families living and where can they afford to live? And um, that may impact where schools are built. And I think we're all very conscientious of the fact that we need to be thinking about how is it that we're utilizing our existing infrastructure and existing buildings as best we can. Um, but it is really uh, uh, more about choice. I hear all the time from people. And in my 22 year career in affordable housing, I heard it all the time from folks that there's just no really good options for people to move out. I just have a lot of records and other things to digitize before I can move to a smaller house. <laughs> Me a, too. Lot of, a lot of work to do, a lot of, <laughs> lot of memories to go through, photos and everything. Um, I want to ask one other thing because I don't want to miss this point. Um, and that is how does this interface and Mayor Davis or, or Emily or Ben, maybe we can comment this. How does this interface with those adjoining agencies? And I, and I mean this specifically with Missoula County in particular, uh, but state and, you know, whoever owns those adjoining lands. Because, you know, in my neighborhood, there was an interesting thing that happened. Because it was like, okay, the county, you know, goes through, does their plan. And it says, well, it ought to be this way. And, of course, this was during the pandemic. So people weren't paying attention. Then all of a sudden it's like, okay, here comes the development and the bulldozers are in, the earth movers. And everybody's like, what happened here? And it was because of that difference between city county and that is adjoining things. How does where we're going here address that sort of functioning and that operation? Mm. Do you want to take that? That's a little sure. more of a technical yeah. question, yeah. but it is, it is something. I mean, we can do wonders inside city limits, yes. but what happens next door and how does that interface? Um, yeah, um, this will. Um, uh, this is a project that's that's focused on um, updating our growth policy um, for the city and an area that extends past the city city limits um, that we call the growth policy boundary. It's in, in a, a, another word we use for it. Our name is the urban fringe, mm -hmm. um, and that's an area where we. Um, uh, pay special attention and, and put focus towards coordinating with the county um, as an area that, um, and, and, and is our, our um, study area for growth um, for the city, for, you know, which we 
when we update these plans is on a 20-year time frame. So that's the that's the area that we are um, evaluating um, and considering for potential or possible growth during that that um, period of time. Um, we don't ex we're not anticipating that we would change that area during this project um, that, that that we know of, um, and and so that that uh, sets the stage or sets the um, expectation for the city um, on you know if if and when there was growth from um, by the city into that area um, what the what the plan is um, and so um, that kind of dynamic is would would continue um, you know following this project that we, that will um, we coordinate with the county we have um, uh, Boards and and yeah, groups and teams that we have that we and yeah. inter, an interlocal agreement that we that we coordinate through and so but but it is it is a, a area of that has its own kind of consideration as far as how that how the rules work how they're applied how that how that's understood by developers and, 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 and residents. County and, is doing some similar things on their side as well. So this mm -hmm. would be where that that interface is. So yeah. but the big objective there is to provide that certainty to the development community to realtors to people that want the, to move in. Uh, people who own farmland yeah. or undeveloped property, what can they do? Mm -hmm. So that structure is is a part of this uh, mechanism. Yeah. Yeah, and we have an opportunity to continue to calibrate that and refine that uh, okay. through this project. We are really uh, almost out of time. <laughs> this has been a great discussion. I want to get, I want to uh, borrow that mic, and I'm going to talk to Ashley real quick about the uh, aspect of, go ahead and jump up here. Let's talk about, I wish we, we should have gone, there, all this is on engagement, right, all of the and stuff like that. So let's talk about if people have been watching this and now they want to be involved. We're in phase three, mm -hmm. moving forward. What are those opportunities for people to be informed and, and be a part of this process? Thanks, Dennis. Yeah, um, I wanted to jump to your question about an innovative idea that a resident had. So um, allowing, obviously, for more diverse housing types, so smaller houses on smaller lots or even like a cottage court type situation. Um, but then for the folks that want to downsize, you elevated a really good point that we've heard from a lot of folks not being able to downsize or kind of move throughout the housing market offering incentives to folks to downsize once there are so, once there's something to downsize in, into so potentially if you're a retiree and you don't need your you know 2,000 3,000 square foot house anymore um, maybe there's some sort of incentive through the city where their idea was to not have to pay property taxes, and I can't promise anything to anybody. I'm not. I'm not authorizing or, or floating this, <laughs> putting pressure on anybody out. anywhere. But that was, I thought, a cool idea. Like if you are trying to kind of move throughout, that um, you get some sort of incentive to do so. But that then would be kind of our responsibility to make sure that there's the diversity of housing types to make that happen. So, kind of a cool idea, really innovative, and something I hadn't heard from folks before. If you have ideas like that, we have a lot of ways that you can get involved. You can always reach out to me. I'm the community engagement specialist for this project and then for our department. And so I'm happy. Emily and I try to be everywhere all the time um, as much as we possibly can without cloning ourselves. We also don't have the technology to do that yet. But um, you can always reach out to me to set up a meeting. We'll be doing a lot of tabling and kind of informal office hours throughout the community. Um, this summer at different community events. And then uh, at the end of June, early July, we'll have some community-wide workshops about scenarios for the future. So taking in all of the stuff that we've heard from our equity and land use engagement, our community growth policy workshops, our expanding housing options workshops, and all the you know analysis that we've done behind the scenes for the last year and a half into a menu of scenarios that kind of offer you know some of these alternatives for growth that we can see as a community. And it won't be like choose A, B, C, or D. You'll actually get to sort of say, hey, I like this over here, this over here, because we're still in that phase sort of, of kind of yeah, like point, right. exactly like you know. Exactly. So hopefully um, end of June, early July, and you are welcome to go to engagemissoula.com backslash r hyphen Missoula or just engagemissoula.com um, and find that information. Um, and we would love to see you at some of our events and we will see you all around the community this summer as well. And, and watch especially for like the neighborhood councils and, and that. A lot of those 
there you're being invited in to make presentations and interface with those yeah places. just last week we were at two different neighborhood meetings we have our city um, chats in the parks initiative that is coming up so we'll be at two other parks um, this summer and then um, hopefully you know community events like pride world refugee day the ada community picnic um, farmers market things like that and then whatever else comes up because we're again hoping to be everywhere this summer and and Plenty of opportunity for folks to comment and write if they're more comfortable doing that or engage in that way too, right? Absolutely, yeah. We try to offer, you know, a lot of background information and, and ways to kind of get involved in a way that, you know, you can kind of jump in midstream and make your voice heard and kind of understand all this really technical information as, as much as we can. So bring it down to a level where even someone like me who isn't a planner can understand it. Um, but then also you're welcome to just email us our all three of our emails are on the website with um our little cheesy photos and you can reach out to any of us and we're happy to um you know hear what you have to say hear are your ideas um and help help you get involved good i'm going to ask emily that too uh, just a final comment about that public part of the process Emily. sure what's coming up yeah yeah um we are really excited to roll out our scenario um part of this project i think this is really like where we get to the crux of, um, you know, we spent a lot of time talking about our values, what the problem is, kind of understanding the foundation of where we, where we are, and 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 what people really care about. And now we can get into like, what do we want to prioritize, and how does that look, and what are the trade offs. So um, I'm really excited for those conversations coming up. And uh, again, as Ashley said, we. Um, are always open to um, go visit with your group or have a coffee chat or um, we just try to be as accessible as possible to um, have people be, feel like they can be a part of this project in whatever way makes sense to them. And, and Mayor Davis, I know we're going back to chats in the parks because, well, soon the weather will improve. And I'm sure you're looking forward to interfacing with people and getting getting them headed in the right direction as we go through this process too, right? Absolutely, and mostly it's just to motivate people to stay you know, involved in the process. We really do want to hear from people in terms of um, perspectives. And naturally, with anything that is change, there are concerns that need to um, that, that need to be vetted. We need to hear from people around um, how we can continue to, you know, Missoula is a beautiful community, and it is something that uh, we're very conscious of the fact that that with change comes some consternation and it comes, you know, there's challenges with that. Um, and we want to be able to make sure we work that into our code so we can come up with a way in which we can achieve a whole host of different options for people. Um, but I am certainly looking forward to continuing to engaging with people and making sure that I remind folks of, of just how easy it really is to, to, to access uh, these fine folks who have really made themselves available continuously and will continue to do so. It's really important. I mean, this is truly a community-led plan and process. And like anything, um, we're busy people and folks often don't have um, the opportunity to attend a meeting. And so I really appreciate the opportunity for this to be on MCAT tonight and it'll be available online and then the links to the information really easily accessible so that way like you said if folks can't attend a meeting they can at least connect with us electronically and even though it's uh, a ways out uh, engage with your city council uh, yes. representatives too so keep them apprised so that when it does hit council <laughs> yeah my, my Nugent's here you Cal councillor Nugent's here yeah there, absolutely <laughs> land use and planning chair yes so this yeah. is a, a an, an area and a project that's of particular interest to him because obviously it's his um, committee is probably one of the busiest that we have when it comes to, you know, public hearings and a number of things. And So, yeah, yeah. whether it's Mike Nugent or any of your council members, uh, really important to, to sort of work and interface with them on that side of it, too, because eventually we'll come action and, and down the road we'll get to that point, too. So Most definitely. Yeah, fantastic. Well, we didn't have a lot of time for questions. Our, our time is up, but uh, I want to appreciate uh, Ben and Emily and Mayor Davis for coming in and Ashley as well and all the staff for discussing this because it really is exciting and uh you know even though i like junk drawers it's nice to know that we can you know in fact if you get this worked out emily you come over i've got a junk drawer for you we'll get through it <laughs> all right well uh well thank you. quick question yeah let's get one in because we're just stand up so we can get you on on the video here so. okay hi um, my name's jennifer and um i have i did go to some of the community um engagement opportunities and the surveys and 
Um, and I would kind of recap some of the considerations moving forward for code reform. But when you talked about the coveted neighborhoods where there's like the mixed use, and I also used to live next to the 12th Street Market, which is now gone, and um, we loved that. And, um, and how like the hip strip and the neighborhoods that originally had different mixed uses in them that are now considered just residential. I'm just curious if moving forward, if there's consideration to like, instead of just taking a whole single family neighborhood and changing that out of single family, like doing parts of it, like, you know, how you can keep some of the stuff that's um, coveted, like to walk to in the third place type of areas, but not necessarily rezone a whole neighborhood. Um, I just don't know if like, I haven't seen any of that in any of the discussions or any of the paperwork as a consideration. I'm just wondering if that's being talked about. Let's, let's get this back over to let Emily, because that was one of my questions too, because I'm a huge fan of this infill question. Where do we go with the older neighborhoods? Yes, so um, this is something that we're going to be exploring in the scenarios, um, one of the menus of options. So um, I highly recommend you come to those events, but um, this is definitely something that we've been thinking about, not necessarily a wholesale rezoning of like a residential district to a commercial or mixed use district, but more so how are there ways that are scalable for, you know, depending on the context of the neighborhood to allow commercial uses or mix a mix of uses in our primarily residential areas. So definitely a topic that we're thinking about and exploring. And um, this is this type of comment is something that we've heard of um, in almost every engagement um, event that we've done. So yeah, that's a great question. And stay tuned for more <laughs> about stay it. Stay tuned for more. <laughs> well, we want to thank all of you for coming. Uh, Mayor Andrea, Andrea Davis, uh, thank you so much for uh, a, a great discussion tonight. We encourage, of course, folks to go to Engage Missoula and uh, look at the documents. There's some wonderful uh, maps in there and, and different suggestions and links and places to comment. And that's probably the best way to do it because it is an engagement process Absolutely. at this point. So, And we want to thank you for joining us uh, for uh, Wednesdays with the Mayor right here at the Missoula Public Library.